Okay, so um, it's going to be a little quick presentation on Walras's law. Um, I'm going to take stuff from MWG, uh, Chapter 3, Section D, and um, Nolan Miller's notes, which are a good companion to MWG. Um, I'm kind of as, <laughs> kind of assuming uh, we know what's going on here, and we're just going to analyze Walras's law a bit. So it's not really supposed to be like teaching you uh, what's going on with the consumer demand problem. It's more just uh, doing some comparative statics and some more in-depth discussion of the law. Um, so the statement of it, Walrus's law is a condition that we place on the um, demand correspondence, this, this function here. Now, the demand correspondence is a function that for any um, P and W, it provides sort of an optimal consumption vector. So there could be there could be a handful of different x's that would be consumption vectors here that we would need this to hold for. But um, what the law states is that the total price of the optimal consumption bundle, so here it's here and here, we see that this is just the price of every good times how much you're consuming of every good. And the law states that that needs to equal your total wealth. So um, you may see this stated in terms of um, surplus demand later in uh, the text and in other stuff, but for here, we're just doing it with the optimal consumption. And yeah, so what it says is basically you can't consume less than your wealth because you know a lot of the time you'll see this condition as uh, one of the constraints, it's the budget constraint, that you have to consume less than or equal to your wealth. Walross's law says that when you're at optimum, that you're going to consume uh, fully all your wealth. And hopefully this is one of the more intuitive assumptions that we see in the chapter. Um, and it follows from local non-satiation, which uh, the definition's in the text. But if you remember, it just says that um, when we're looking at our budget set, there's going to be a point um, that's nearby that we can move to that's going to be more preferred. So the reason why Walrus's law here follows from that is that if we're consuming less than our wealth with our consumption X, then by local non-satiation, there's some nearby consumption bundle Y that is also going to be um, less than our total wealth, and it's going to be more preferred. But this is going to contradict what it means for X to be an optimal consumption um, bundle that's in the demand correspondence. So that's a contradiction. So basically the idea is you're always going to move up to the border of your consumption or of your uh, the, the line that uh, denotes uh, where W is on your um, budget set. So we can look at some, this is all, the, the, the following is from Miller's notes where he's um, going to walk us through uh, comparative statics to see what happens. Um, when different things change, and we're going to see how we can mess with Walras's law to uh, let us an analyze some of, some of those changes and the responses to those changes. So we want to see what happens if we increase wealth slightly. So it's going to be a small amount, um, and we're not going to really define that because we're just doing differentials, so or derivatives, sorry. So we want to see how a consumer is going to change their consumption, which is shown on the left, um, when wealth changes. So we're going to take the derivative of the whole the whole thing with respect to W here. When we do that, we get this equation. So the derivative of W with respect to W is obviously going to be 1, right? If we change it by a little bit, it's going to change by that much, right? It's just going to change by 1. And then here, we're going to take the partial derivative of our demand correspondence function um, in this case, it's it's indexed for each good, and we're going to take that with respect to W. So this is going to say that for each good, um, we're it's it, we're looking at a function that tells us how much of that good we consume, uh, depending on P and W. We're going to see how much it changes, how much that specific function changes when we change W. That's what this term is saying, and then we're just multiplying that by the price of that good. So again, kind of what I just said, the left-hand side is going to be the, the change in total expenditure 
due to the wealth increase. And then the right-hand side is just the increase in wealth. So since we differentiate both sides, and this is an identity that holds, um, any change in wealth is going to come with an equal change in the expenditure that the consumer spends. So also, um, you'll this comes into play later in the textbook a lot, but we see that the left-hand side is going to be made up of positive and negative terms, and that's because um, some goods are normal goods and some goods are inferior goods. So if wealth is increasing um, and you're having an inferior good, then this term is going to be negative, right? Maybe you buy less rice when you get richer or something. <coughs> so this is going to be a mix of positive and negative values. So that's, that's what happens when wealth change, and here we're going to look at what happens when price changes, the price of one good, for instance, which is going to be uh, good J. So we take the derivative of everything, of uh, both sides, with respect to the price of good J. And that's going to give us this equation, and notice that we changed the, um, the indexes here. So this whole thing does not include good J, because we pulled good J out. So this is not the same summation term here. So what happens is, obviously, when we take the derivative of, you know, if you expand this, you're going to have pj xj here. And you take the derivative of that, you're just going to get xj, right? And then in here is basically what we had earlier, except this is going to say how um, consumption of good i changes with respect to a um, change in good j. So this is going to depend on if things are substitutes or complements. So for instance, if you, you know, if the price of jelly goes up, you're probably going to buy less peanut butter is the, is the good example, right? Because now you can afford, uh, you're going to not want to buy as much jelly, so you're also going to probably make less peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Or, you know, maybe the price of hot dogs go down, so you might buy more hot dog buns so you can eat more hot dogs, right? So that's, that, all that's going to be captured here. So this term our leftmost term, is going to tell us how much spending increases on good J, assuming we um, purchase the same amount. And the summation term is what I just talked about. It's rearranging all other goods depending on how um, they're affected by the, the change in the price of J. And then since we have zero here, it means that these two things need to effectively cancel out. If we're spending more here, then we need to rearrange our stuff to sort of cancel out this, the extra spending that comes from a price increase. And that can't change our, um, it can't change our total expenditure. Now we're going to go over elasticities and we're going to kind of talk about the two things we talked about before, but in terms of elasticities. So <coughs> we could talk about the price elasticity, which is described here, which is the demand for good I with, or sorry, the elasticity of demand for good I with respect to the price of good J is captured by all of this. And what it is is the percentage change in the consumption of XI when the price of a different good, good J, changes by 1%. So this is the equation for that. Now, if we go back to uh, what we were looking at when the price of J, uh, P, when the price of good J changes, we have this equation. And we notice that this kind of, we see some terms that kind of look like these terms, right? So maybe we can, we can manipulate it a little bit to get this in terms of elasticities. So it's missing pj over xi. pj over xi is what we're missing. So what we can do is we can multiply both sides by a new term, pj over w. The, the W is going to come into play later because we'll be able to use that to sort of um, have a new term that's going to have a nice uh, interpretation. And we're going to multiply everything by PJ over W, and we're going to multiply the terms inside the summation by XI over XI, which is just one, obviously, so we're not changing anything. So this gives us this whole thing. All we did was what we said we were going to do. And... Here we're just rearranging a bit to get stuff looking more the way we want it to look. And at this last step, we're going to introduce this new function here, which is b sub j or b sub i. 
of price and wealth. So all that that says is that is the share of total wealth that's spent on the indexed good. So here we see that this is your total wealth and this is the spending on good J. This is the amount of money you spend on good J. So this just gives you basically a proportion of total wealth that's spent on each good. So it's, it's nice to write it like that. And then we now have our elasticity term, so we can write the elasticity of um, good I with respect to the price of J. And we'll see on the next slide, we can this lets us maybe interpret what we're looking at a little easier. So what this says is that if we raise the price of J a little bit, then if the consumer doesn't change anything, then this must change the proportion of wealth that she spends on that good, right? So again, if you're going to just every week buy 10, I, I don't know, cheeseburgers, and the price of cheeseburgers goes up and you don't rearrange, you don't change how many cheeseburgers you buy, the proportion of your total wealth that you spend on cheeseburgers is going to go up. So that's captured here. And that's the wealth effect. So what the wealth effect says is that, in this case, um, if the price is changing, it's going up, and you're going to buy the same amount, then you're actually going to feel poorer, relatively poorer, right? And that's what we call the wealth effect, which is captured by this term. Now, if good J becomes more expensive, and you're not changing how much you consume of good J, then obviously you need to change your spending on everything else, right? You're going to have to buy less of some stuff. You might rearrange stuff, buy more, we don't know. But the way we see that how the rearrangement occurs is that this depends on how much is spent on each good. And, you know, as a proportion of wealth is what we care about. So that's that B sub I term here. And to see how much um, that changes in response to P sub J, we're going to multiply by the responsiveness, which is the elasticity. Right? So you're taking each term or each proportion and you're multiplying it by how responsive that is to the change in pj. And that's going to give us the total rearrangement. And this is called the substitution effect. So hopefully that's easy enough to remember. Right, It sort of makes sense if you kind of think about everything in your head when you're just sort of analyzing this out loud to yourself. So the whole equation, you know, it equals, you see the right-hand side, zero. So it tells us that the wealth and the substitution effect um, combine or cancel each other out to uh, give us no change in expenditure, which again, hopefully is um, intuitive. And we see why this sort of has to be true with Walras's law. And you can view it as a restatement of Walras's law, just in terms of elasticities and proportions of wealth. And, um, oh, so we're going to look at the, uh, the wealth effect again in terms of elasticities, or not, sorry, not the wealth effect, the, um, the, res the responsiveness to a change in wealth in terms of elasticities. So this is what happened when we differentiated both sides of the Walras's law equation with regards to wealth. So uh, we can write our elasticity for good I um, induced by a 1% increase in wealth like this. This is hopefully uh, clear why this is basically the same thing as the price, except we're just doing it with regards to wealth. And what we can do, we're going to do the same thing. We want this to look a certain way. We want to look have some terms in here that look like elasticities and look like our uh, wealth proportions. So we multiply the whole thing by x sub i w over x sub i w, and we can write then, we can write it like this, which going off our earlier discussion, this is just how much good i changes in response to wealth as a proportion of total wealth. So what this says is when wealth increases, total spending changes by the elasticity weighted by the budget share for each good. And again, this is sort of something that hopefully, if you think about Walras's Wal law, this is something that has to be true, right? So throughout all this, everything we kind of talked about, we're reconfirming or recontextualizing what Walras's law means. And hopefully this little presentation will give a better understanding of that. Thanks for watching.